please join me in the Christian flag pledge. I pledge of allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for those one brotherhood uniting all mankind in service and love. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. On behalf of New Philadelphia Moravian Church and on behalf of our scout troops, did you hear this? Our scout troops, 715 and 964, I welcome all of you this morning. I was reminded of this blessing that you see here before you when I was looking over the order of worship for today. We are using the scout liturgy that we used last year, but something has changed in a wonderful way. I'd invite you to look at your bulletin and open it up and look at the middle page. And about halfway down, the congregation responds, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to God's Word. Well, guess what? God's word is for everyone. Young men, young women, boys, girls, old men, old women, and I'm not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> and people in our history have worked really hard to help people understand that. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to respond. Instead of saying, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to God's word, when we join in that liturgy, say, how can young people keep their way pure, and since way is singular, by guarding it according to God's word. So you just need to change that first part. How can young people keep their way pure? And we'll worry about old people next Sunday. So let's stand and sing the hymn, and then we'll continue with our Liturgy for Scout Sunday. Please stand. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep it, his covenant and his testimony. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. On my honor, I will do my best to help other people at all times. Remember also to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. On my honor, I will do my best. 
be kind to all people. Obtain wisdom, develop good judgment, don't forget God's word or turn away from them. God has shown us what is good and what is required. Please be seated. Good morning. My name is Paul Williams. I'm Scoutmaster for 715. And real quick, I'd like to thank Karsten and Kayla. Karsten McCosco is our Senior Patrol Leader with Troop 715. Kayla McGinnis is with Troop 964, and they led us in the liturgy and the pledge. And then Abby Weeks and, and uh, Prakash Keeley, who carried the flags up, so thank you. So this morning, I finished my notes for this little speech, and I showed them to my wife, and she just started laughing. So you guys all get ready for this. I'm going to give you an update on the Cub Pack. I'm going to give you an update on the troop, and then we're going to transition to uh, telling you a little bit about 964. So the Cubs 715 Cub Pack is led by Adam Pristis and um, Bernie Mathen. That troop got hit, that group got hit really hard during COVID and it shrunk down to just a few guys, but they've done a really good job of building it back up. It's 11 scouts right now, which is excellent. And the reason that's critical is that Cub Pack serves as a feeder troop. They bring both boys and girls into the troops. Uh, so, so building up those numbers are important and they're doing a really good job of getting back from a low count. They've had uh, the tremendous recruiting effort this fall. They've had fundraising success. They've been selling popcorn. They've been selling coffee, which is a unique idea, and they've done really well with that fundraiser. And then they recently had a great turnout on a fall Cub Pack adventure where all the new parents got to see firsthand what scouting is all about. And just yesterday, they enjoyed using the Fellowship Hall to do their, um, their Pinewood Derby where they all won prizes and had a good time. So I think... Uh, they had a good time, and I'm glad to see some members of our Cub Pack here. If you're with the Cub Pack, will you just raise your hand so we can see who else here? Okay. All right, excellent. Troop 715, that is, um, and they, would, they did specifically say they wanted to make sure and thank the church for the use of the facilities because they do use um, the Fellowship Hall and other parts of the church on a regular basis on Monday nights. 715, we currently have 34 scouts. We have about 25 leaders that are active. Uh, registered adults and I just want to say a personal thanks to all of our adult leaders that's leaders that are in uniform and leaders that are serving on the committee because we couldn't do what we do for the troop without the adult leadership so I'm so grateful for that I want to name a few scouts that you all know we have some scouts in the troop and that's Wynn Greenwood Benton Starling William Starling and Luke Williams these are all members here at the church and so I wanted to highlight them and then on the uh, leader side that are active here at the church Josh Clark Charlie Greenwood Drew Starling Lori Starling and Jerry Taylor, and then I also want to mention Bruce Bradley, who has been active in a council role and then as our elder rep for a number of years. So, and then lastly, I want to mention Florence um, Norris Math, and many of you knew Florence from her membership here at the church years ago, but she's back. She's been involved in the Cubs and the, um, and the Troop program. So thank you to those that are members here, but thank you to all of the adult leaders that are participating. Um, and, and lastly, I just want to take a moment to mention Mr. Walter Craver. Um, He, uh, I, I thought I'd keep it together. He, um, he was scoutmaster when I was 
in Scouts. He passed away last year, and he was just the guy that embodied everything good about scouting. And big, big loss for the troop, but he was an important part of the program in my life. So God rest his soul. All right, a little bit about the troop, what we've been doing. Last year, we had numerous trips in the spring. We had scout camp last summer. We had two groups that went to sea base. That was one group that went to the Bahamas and did a week-long adventure on a sailboat. We had another group that went to the Keys in August and did a week-long adventure on a sailboat there. We had an overnight camping trip on the New River in the fall. We had a hiking trip to the Uaris. We had a rock tower climbing event at Raven Knob, and then we closed out the year with, some, um, with a lock-in here at the church and just had a had a great time and we have more coming this spring we've also been active with some service projects we've been doing some um, work on work with meals for wheels because one of the things that that the meals provide to people is food for the, themselves but it doesn't always uh, meet the needs of their pets and so we've been um, organizing animal food that we can package and take with the meals on wheels deliveries so that people can feed their pets as well so that's been something our troop has been able to participate in um, Advancement is something that's important to mention. We have put out over 80, I think 80 is the number, eagles from Troop 715 since its inception. So that's a big number. Last year I didn't mention this, but I want to mention the two groups that have earned their eagle in the past two years. We had nine scouts. In 2021, we had Chansey Matthews, Josh Melvin, Jack Blankenbaker, who's here, um, J. Raj Keeley and Wyatt Garrison that all earned their eagle. In 2022, we had Aiden Badush, Michael Farrell, Ryan Blank Bank and Blaker, who is also here, and uh, Josh Connolly earned their Eagles last year. So we've had tremendous progress in that, that arena. And then we've got two scouts that have finished their projects, Bradley Prince and William Starling, both are here today, and they're wrapping up the details, and so they'll be earning their Eagle very soon, so we're real proud of those guys. I want to make you aware, one of the reasons that we're able to do so much that we're able to do is because we have the funding and support of the church, and on February the 18th, we're going to be having a barbecue here at the church, the first one we've had since 2020, so we ask all of you to uh, come and support us. That'll be in the fellowship hall. More news will be out in the bulletin and on the church website, but that'll be a sit-down meal. That's the last time. We've, we've sold Boston Butts in the past couple years, but we've not been able to have a sit-down meal, so we're going to do that again on February the 18th. Um, and I want to give a little praise to Joey Trans, who Joey's going to be cooking our meat. And for those of you, you see Joey do his, his volunteer service work around, and he serves a lot of organizations. But Joey's, he does this for no cost. And he has raised over $500,000 toward service-oriented organizations through his help by preparing that meat. So thank you, Joey. I don't know if you're here, but Joey has been a tremendous help to our troop and many organizations. Lastly, on your way out, uh, we're doing scouting for food this week, um, so we'll have some scouts positioned at the doors, and we'll be handing out bags, and if you don't mind, please grab one, fill it up with some food, bring it back next week, and we will make sure that gets to a food bank that will benefit from it. Historically, we've given that food to Sunnyside Ministries, which is the food bank that, our, um, that the Moravian Church supports. So now, I want to give you a little history lesson about our troop. Jerry Taylor gave me some information that dates back about, um, about uh, this. And Troop 15 is what it was called, was chartered in 1936. And it was disbanded around uh, World War II. But then after the war, the meeting place was remodeled. Uh, apparently it was previously a chicken house in the South Fork community and it was you know, not much. But then our present building, the scout hut that you guys have seen over here in this corner of the building, uh, the property was started in 1947. And it was built by men of South Fork community. There was a gentleman that used to be a member here, Mr. Roy Poindexter. He was owner of Poindexter Lumber Company, and his family's had members here as well. Uh, he donated the material, and then sometime around 1956, Troop 15 became Troop 715. And then in the early 90s, the addition was added. Paul Barber, another member of our church, has passed on. He, he, led, he was the lead person getting some of that into place, Jerry and Paul and others work together to expand the building and put new siding on it. So now when you look at that building, it looks like it's always been what it is today. And if you go in it, you can see there's multiple rooms and there's expansion area and it's allowed for us to have a lot of activity inside that building. And it is a wonderful facility that serves the scout program. So we're very fortunate to have that. And the reason I want to give you a history level lesson is because now we're expanding that from this male generation of boys and scouts to the girls that are with us today, Troop 964. And I want to make a brief introduction to them. Um, 
This is one of the first girls troops in the area. A number of the girls that were in our pack group left here and went to 964, which was then in Mount Tabor Methodist Church. And for various reasons, Mount Tabor's uh, charter expired and they needed to find a new place to call home. And so as they were looking around, Megan Duggins, who is their scoutmaster and is going to come speak to you in just a minute, she was proactive. She was jumping in to try to find a new place to meet. She met with Pastor Gray. She came and toured the facility. It was a combination of the way that the church made them feel welcome and the facilities that we have to offer that I think I'm safe saying were the tipping scale to come back and be a part of New Philadelphia. So now we get to have Troop 964 here. And when we first started talking, one of the questions I asked her, because I didn't know how the whole numbering situation worked. I said, are you guys going to change your number to something relative to 715 and she said no 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 there's a story behind our number and I want to share that with you who knows what happened in 1964 shout it out civil rights okay so 1964 civil rights movement uh, act of 1964 was voted in and as a part of the back end of that women were enabled to vote and so the number 964 they couldn't have all of 1964 964 is a, is a part of that, and that's an important part of that to them. And so I'm excited to have them here. I'm grateful that you all made it here today and to show the numbers of people that are working with us, and, and I look forward to seeing what you guys um, are, gonna, are gonna do as we go forward. Now, as Megan comes forward, I wanna mention one more thing. Megan, you can come, come on up. The, um, I mentioned we had some eagles. Eagles are st statistically significant. Like 2% of scouts earn their eagle. It's a small number. It's a high honor, and it takes a lot of work to get there. One of the things they have to do is they've got to generate the idea, create a project, raise funds for that project, execute upon that project, and then complete the paperwork that goes along with it. So that, And it's pretty, pretty involved to get through this process. So Nora Alexander is with us today. She is an eagle with Troop 964, and one of the ways she is funding her project is through a bake sale that she has organized back here in the room behind us. You might have seen some of her options as you came in. Please support her. After you get done, if you, if you can step in there and take a look at what she's got, um, we want to help her get her eagle. And I know it um, looked like some pretty good baked goods to, to enjoy as well. So with that, I'd like to say thanks to the church, and I would like to welcome Megan up to introduce 964. Good morning. You didn't leave much for me there. Scoutmaster. So uh, I'll be doing the sermon. Um, you can sit this one out, Pastor Gray. Uh, hi, I'm Megan Duggins, and this is my rambunctious group of lovable goofballs. Um, we did come from uh, Mount Tabor United Methodist, and uh, we came over here and, and just inquiring about the space and and. Um, I can say going to church after church that we've never felt more welcome. Um, that was a big thing for me and my girls. I, I wanted people to want us to be a part of their youth programs, to be a part of their congregation, a part of their church and their mission. And so um, this was just kind of a, a no brainer in the end. It was just, it was a great place for us to go. Um, I have 46, I believe now, registered scouts in our program. Um, we've got four Eagles. We were started in 2019, and so that's a pretty good run for a girls' troop that was gathering some steam. Um, one of the big accomplishments that we had is we just came from this uh, miserable thing called Klondike, and basically what the Klondike Derby is is a, it's a showing off of your scout skills, but you have to do it in 19-degree weather. Um, you have to sleep in a tent. I don't know why they make us do that, but they did. And um, our girls went out there and um, absolutely crushed it and took first place overall. So um, number one, a girls troop has never done that, yes. Thank you. Uh, number one, a girls troop has never done that at Klondike Derby. Um, and number two, we went in as uh, underdogs, I guess you would say. And uh, I don't think they saw us coming, but they see us now. Um, so uh, I'm super proud of my girls on that. Um, one of the things that I like to say about these kids is that uh, the motivation that they have for this program and for what they do is not provided by me. It is provided by them. 
and we all think about teenagers as being kind of lazy or always on their phones and that kind of thing. Let me tell you right now, that is not these kids. Not all the time, we have phones out. But for the most part, these girls, they take this program and they run with it. And so I'm super proud to be a part of this. Um, I've got a group of leaders that <laughs> I cannot say enough about. Um, We're overworked and underpaid to say the least. So um, this is just a, a wonderful church to be a part of. We're very happy to be here. We've got another eagle in the shoots. We've got Nora right behind her is a couple more. Um, if you guys have any questions, if you would like to get your kids involved in scouting, if you guys would like to just know what, what I do or, or, or how to help our program, please come see me afterwards. Um, Pastor Gray has my contact information. You can give that to literally anyone. Um, and we'll get you guys in there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having us here. I mean, it's, it's, I just, it feels really good. It feels great to feel wanted. Um, so if you have any questions, let me know. And uh, thank you. Good morning. You can do better than that. All right, this morning, Troop 715 wants to recognize one of our <clears throat> former assistant scoutmasters and present to him the order of the David Zeisberger Award. And this award, <coughs> excuse me, this award is given by the Moravian Church <clears throat> to recognize adult leaders who have given distinguished service to scouting. This man has done that. <clears throat> How many of you know who David Zeisberger was? You better know. <laughs> Mr. Zeisberger was a <clears throat> Moravian missionary, and he spent his entire life, <clears throat> if I can make it, teaching, preaching, <clears throat> and ministering <clears throat> to Native Americans in Ohio and Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and a number of years ago, a member of this congregation gave me a framed picture, and it <clears throat> hangs in our building today. But to give you one example of what this person did, <clears throat> in early 2002, I asked the members of the troop, how many of you would like to learn, <clears throat> earn the uh, Moravian God and Country Award? And several of them said they would like to do that. I said, well, now let me tell you what some of the requirements are. You must write a 500-word essay on your life's ambitions. Do 40 hours of service for your church, and a 1,000-word essay on the history of the Moravian Church. And then you have to meet on a different night other than our regular meeting night or a Sunday afternoon. Now, how many of you still want to do this? Six of them raised their hand. Plus, we were joined by another scout, not a member of Troop 715, but a member of this congregation. Well, the next thing I was obligated to do was find some counselors. And I told them the same story. This is a serious commitment. They said, we're not going to do this in three weeks. And I called three. The last person I called is a man we're going to recognize this morning. And he never hesitated. I'll do that. This is the booklet that was used <clears throat> and still used today. Small in size, the contents huge. Reverend Henry May wrote many of the requirements that had to be met. Reverend May served this congregation for several years. He was a true friend of scouting. So those boys did complete our God and Country Award, and we have one of them here this morning. And I was told by the Southern Province at this time, that would have been October 2003, that was the largest group of Moravian scouts, Moravian, boy, Moravian church charter scout troop that had earned this. This is a photo if you'd like to come up after the service and take a look at it. So this man made a serious commitment too of his time and his skills. 
So, Jack Shore, if you'd come forward. <clears throat> What a lot of good news, <laughs> but there is even more. Welcome to all of you, all of the scouts and everyone else who is here and greetings to all of you who are watching um, from home. We have several items of news this morning, beginning with top of the agenda, which is the variety show this evening at five o'clock in the fellowship hall. Evie wants to remind you all to bring um, a snack or finger food. This is gonna be a potluck and a lot of fun. Come and support some tremendous acts and talent. Marla Sparks, I hope you have noticed, I know you're here, the toothbrushes, oh yes, the toothbrush box is getting full. Toothbrushes, toothpaste, remember we have a goal of 540 for our Southwark students and we are well on our way. Thank you also to everyone who has stepped forward to say, sure, I don't mind making a pot of soup. We have nine or 10 folks signed up to make soup for our Ash Wednesday soup and salad dinner, so plans are underway and going very well for that. Two dozen of you have signed up for our program on Moravian Decorative Arts and Furniture, and that's on the 16th in the banquet room, 9.30, sugar cake and coffee, and then the program by Johanna Brown at 10. That's going to be a wonderful time to celebrate Moravian history. Our Lenten devotion guide goes into the hands of the printer tomorrow morning. It will be distributed on the Sunday before Ash Wednesday. Thanks again to artists and writers and, of course, to Paula Chryson. Don't forget the IHOP breakfast on Shrove Tuesday, 9 o'clock. IHOP and Clemens called the office. Let us know that you are coming. As has been mentioned already, Walter Craver had a tremendous impact on scouting and leaves a wonderful legacy. The flowers today are in his honor. Next Sunday, one service, 10 o'clock, Cairo, a cappella group from Wake Forest will be here. That is going to be a tremendous service. And then lastly, from the chaplain, Jeff Carter, at the Forsyth, um, from Forsyth Jail and Prison Ministry, there is going to be a Super Bowl party next week for the men at the Cherry Street Prison. He is looking for donations of snacks like pre-popped popcorn. Gosh, don't you scouts sell that sometimes? Um, packaged snacks and soft drinks. And so if you'd like to be part of that, drop those donations off at the prison Monday through Thursday this week, 10 to 4 p.m. I believe that's it. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. God of wonders, Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, we thank you for the beauty of your earth, the beauty of your creation. We thank you that when you created all things, you looked around and called, called it good. And then you created human beings, and you called us very good. We thank you for that gift of creation. We ask your forgiveness for the times when we fail to live up to your image in which you created us. We ask you to help us recognize the things that tarnish and get in the way of that image. But we thank you especially for the gift of your son, our redeemer. We thank you for making a way for us to restore that image that you desire for us, that dream for your creation. We thank you for your spirit that sustains us wherever we are. 
out in the beauty of nature here in this place, in our homes, at school, at work, at play. Thank you for your presence with us always. In Jesus' name, amen. There is so much that happens within these walls and outside of these walls that you can support through your tithes and offerings. And so this morning, we ask you to give generously, whether it is here um, through our offering plates in the vestibule or through secure online portals. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you but your own, whatever the gift may be, and all that we have is yours alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we your bounties as stewards truly receive, and gladly, as you have blessed us, to you our first fruits give. Amen. Last few weeks, we've been doing something we're calling.
power lines. I don't know about you, but I'm not great at memorizing scripture. I'm not great at memorizing anything. So holding on to scripture that we can hold inside of ourselves and pull up when we need a little bit of strength. So we're doing something called power lines, and it's in likely in your bulletin, and it looks like this. So flip it over to the side where you see the printed words, and read with me. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, from Psalm 119, 105. Okay, so flip it on the other side, and you see just the first letter of each of those words, and it helps you to kind of go over it in your mind and commit it to memory. So do it with me again on this side. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Psalm 119, 105. We've been doing these for the last few weeks, and we're pulling them up, and Pastor Sam's quizzing people um, each week on ones that have gone past. So take that home, put it on your mirror, um, put it in your car, wherever you will look at it a couple times during the week, and commit that to memory so that you can pull it out when you need a little bit of strength. In just a moment, after the scripture reading, I'll be leaving with children um, up through second grade. You can join me over here at the door, and we'll go out and do our own worship while the adults are doing the service. Corinthians 2, 1 through 12. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God to you with superior speech or wisdom, for I decided to not know nothing, or to, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and his crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were made not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that you've, your faith might, not, might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are being destroyed. But we speak God's wisdom, a hidden mystery, which God decreed before the ages for our glory, in which none of the rulers of this age understood. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for what human knows what is truly human, except the human spirit that is within. So also no one comprehends what is truly God's, except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer any good for anything but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under the bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they might see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until it's all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does the, them teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Paul and Megan and I were having a little bit of a discussion and a contest on who was going to speak the longest. Um, I, my my um, sermon is the same number of pages as Paul's comments, but of course he uses... 12 font and I use about 16 so I can so I can see so so we'll see but anyway I think we should probably stand and sing this hymn before I deliver a short message today
noche. Please be seated. And imagine just for a moment that you're out in the wilderness, the countryside. There are hills and valleys and lilies growing all around. And you can hear sparrows chirping as they fly around in the beautiful blue sky above you. It's very warm, but there's a light breeze blowing and that makes it bearable, even pleasant, not 19 degrees anyway. And there's a lake off in the distance, just to the south of you. And you take a deep breath and it feels like you're breathing in the beauty of nature, the wonder of God's creation. Now I'm guessing that our scouts and maybe others of you don't really have to just imagine that scene. You've been there. Well, maybe not this particular place, but somewhere like it. A place that's set apart from the hustle and bustle of daily life, a place that you might describe as peaceful and serene, maybe even solitary and a little lonely. But today is different. The silence of that place has been disrupted by a crowd of people. They've come out from the surrounding villages because they've heard that someone special is going to show up, a man that they've been hearing about, a carpenter's son from Nazareth. He's 30 years old and he's been creating quite a stir. They've heard about him, but they want to hear directly from him. And the person next to you nudges you and says, there he is. And you see him hiking up a little hill. Well, the locals call it a mountain, even though at its highest point, it's still below sea level, but at least it's a lot higher than, than the lake down below. And this man whose name is Jesus of Nazareth 
goes up there so that the crowd can see him, and more importantly, so that you can hear what he has to say. And you wonder, what will he tell us about himself? You've heard that he's supposed to be the Son of God, the Messiah. A bunch of shepherds spread the word around that when he was born, an angel appeared to them when they were camping out one night, scared them half to death, and told them that this man was the Savior, Christ the Lord. Maybe he would finally save them from the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. So you can't wait to hear what he will say about himself. And he sits down and he looks out over the crowd and he starts talking about other people who are blessed. And then he seems to be looking right at you and he says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Wait, you mean this is about me? I came to hear about you. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. Well, now he's got your attention. Because you may not know a whole lot about religious things, but you certainly know what salt is and what light is. Salt was so simple back then. It came from the salty waters of the Dead Sea, and it was an important part of life, not just for seasoning food. No, it was used to preserve food, to keep it from going bad or spoiling or, or rotting. If you caught a whole bunch of fish from that lake over there, it didn't matter that you didn't have a freezer. You could dry them out and salt them and they would last for a long time. Salt was a disinfectant. We talk about pouring salt on someone's wounds in a bad way, meaning to make a bad situation worse, but they used salt to keep a wound from getting infected. Salt was an important part of their offerings and sacrifices at the temple. People even got paid sometimes with salt. Our English word salary begins with S-A-L, which is Latin for salt, because sometimes their salary was salt. So salt was very important and very well known. And when this teacher, Jesus, said, you are the salt of the earth, they all probably pictured the same thing, just plain salt. But have you been in the salt section of the grocery store lately? It's not that simple anymore. Yes, there is plain old salt. But then there's iodized salt and sorry, iodized salt and kosher salt and fine sea salt and pink Himalayan salt and even no salt or salt substitute and light salt or salt light. You see where I'm going with this, I think. Because you see, following Jesus was pretty simple and straightforward back then too. He would say, follow me, and you would either follow or else come up with an excuse not to follow, and that was pretty much it. But just like the salt, we've kind of complicated things down through the years. We have lots of different groups of Christ followers, and I like to think of all of these different kinds of salt as different kinds of churches. We have just plain and simple churches, no additives like our Amish and Mennonite brothers and sisters, no frills. Then we have iodized churches. They've added something that isn't necessarily salt, but it's something good, something helpful. Like some churches have exercise classes or financial management courses or English as a second language. Those are good things added to the original salt. Churches with helpful additives. And then there are the kosher churches. Our brothers and sisters who hold fast to Jewish traditions and customs, but in a Christian context. And you see it says coarse salt. Churches that are unrefined and proud of it. They don't see that as a criticism. They are the churches that aren't afraid to tell it like it is. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Coarse and happy to be that way. Then there's the natural sea salt churches. 
These are the traditional churches that try to preserve things the way they've been down through the ages and keep telling that old, old story that took place by the Sea of Galilee. Of course, the land salt churches criticize the sea salt churches because they say, Jesus specifically said, you are the salt of the earth, not of the sea. And you see, that says that this salt is fine. Fine churches, the high church churches, churches with lots of liturgy and bells and smoke and robes and candles and majestic worship services with a lot of pageantry and ceremony, fine churches, pink Himalayan salt. Those are the cool churches, churches with pastors whose shirts aren't tucked in and who preach from a tablet, and I'm not talking about the ones that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, Churches with praise bands and videos projected on the big screen and coffee available even when it's not a love feast. Now, I can't pretend to know the mind of God, but I think God is okay with all of this. Some see this as division. I see this as diversity. All the flavors, all the varieties in the great salt shaker that is the body of Christ. We've got coarse churches and fine churches and land salt churches and sea salt churches and simple churches and churches with lots of programs and ministries, and I think that's great. But what is not good is no salt. Salt substitute. Now, I know that some of us have bodies that can't take real salt, and salt substitute does have its purpose, but if the body of Christ can't handle the truth of the gospel and has to settle for a substitute gospel, then we're in trouble. Think of all the substitutes that take the place of the message that Jesus proclaimed. But you see, when our allegiance is to another agenda, political, social, economic, personal, whatever, then we find ourselves having to adapt or mold our Christianity to fit with that agenda or within that agenda, and then we're in trouble. And sometimes we find ourselves settling for salt light, a watered down gospel, a church that leaves out the parts that are difficult or painful, a church with 50% less boldness and commitment to Jesus. Jesus didn't say that we are to be the L-I-T-E of the world. No, he said we are to be the L-I-G-H-T, the light of the world. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But then he said, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. What does that mean? Well, remember I said that salt was used for flavoring and for, for healing and lots of things. There was something else that salt was used for in Jesus' time. The Romans, as you probably know, built a whole system of roads throughout the empire. And those roads were basically paved with a crude mixture of stones and dirt, but they used salt as a binding agent to hold that mortar together. So low-grade salt was used for that purpose, and it was literally trampled under foot. For a Jewish person living in that place and in that time, the thought of being used not for God's purposes but for the purposes of the evil empire was unthinkable. And Jesus said that when it comes to salt that has lost its saltiness, that's all it's good for. But how does salt lose its saltiness? I mean, it has one job, be salty. I checked out all these containers and none of them have an expiration date or a best if sold by date. Salt doesn't expire. The good news of Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. No, the only way that salt can lose its flavor is if it's diluted. If instead of understanding that Jesus calls us to be salt and light, we just try to be salt light, then we've lost our saltiness our purpose in the world. And what is that purpose? Well, bringing flavor, preserving, healing, illuminating, guiding, all of the things that salt and light do. But how? How can we be salt and light in our world? Well, when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world, the pronoun that he used for you was plural. Not you and, and you and, and you, no, you. You are the salt. You are the light of the world. One grain of salt by itself is not very helpful. 
We have to let God gather us in and shake us up and spread us around to be God's agents in the world. And salt is not significant in and of itself. You don't sit down to a meal and eat a bowl of salt. If you say, please pass the salt, you will better have something else there. You're not just saying, please pass the salt so that I can eat the salt. You're going to put it on something else. Salt is essential for what it enables to happen. Light is that as well. You don't stare at a light bulb. Light helps us see something else. So maybe the message for us is that we need to get together with all of the other grains of salt, all of the other rays of light, and let God fulfill in and through us the vision, the dream that God has for God's world and God's children. Let God use us to make a difference. We do that in many ways by being trustworthy and loyal and helpful and friendly and courteous and kind and obedient and cheerful and thrifty and brave and clean and, and, and reverent and by helping others, by being filled with God's flavor and God's light and then sharing that wherever we are because we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And may that light never be hidden, and may that salt never lose its flavor. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the amazing example of your son, Jesus. We thank you that somehow you entrust us to be that salt and that light in your amazing world. Bless us as we go out and seek to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. But stand and sing, I the Lord of sea and sky.
I prepare to ask God's blessing on us and on those who are watching online. Again, I want to say how thankful and joyful we are to, to see this, this, this crowd of scouts up here. It really does me um, good and gives me a lot of joy to look out over all of these um, young, smiling faces. We would never, um, ever, um, try to convince someone to leave a church where they are and say, hey, come on, our, ours is better. But I would say, if you are not involved in a church in other ways other than scouts, please know that you are welcome here at any time and for, for any reason. We would love to have you at any of the events um, and services that we have here. So I lift a hand asking God's blessing on us, and I ask the whole congregation to lift a hand today specifically asking God's blessing on all of these scouts and on the leaders and on the wonderful ministry that goes on right here on our campus and we're so blessed for that so please lift a hand asking God's continued blessing on them the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus amen